few questions for you. Tracy is being overly critical of the profession of SLPs and appears to have no criticism for the field of behavior analysis and ABA. In fact, she actually said SLPs do harm and need to rethink their practice. How can this lead to better collaboration? And please comment on the any criticism for the field of behavior analysis and ABA. The point wasn't to dis either practice the, the point or either field. The point was to say if things are resonating with you, whether you're a speech pathologist or a behavior analyst, it's because there's things we need to change about both fields. I work, I'm a speech pathologist. That was my primary first profession. I absolutely don't know how behavior analysts work with children with autism without the speech pathology knowledge. First of all, I, I, if, if I could set the standards, my standards would be that you cannot work with an individual with ASD unless you have both. That's what I would set. That's not going to be possible, and I don't have that much power. Um, so I guess that won't happen. But what I, the harm part was me. I, I felt I did harm. Do I see every single day behavior analysts or behavior consultants doing harm? Absolutely. I see that all the time as well. And what I see most is that they don't call in speech pathologists soon enough. And I think I said that, and you may have been angry enough that you weren't hearing at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and anger is a good thing. Sometimes it promotes dialogue. And like I, I wasn't kidding when I said this is the big white elephant in the room for both fields. So I'm kind of I I've got broad shoulders. I work in both fields. I hear it all the time. I get it in Ontario. I get attacked politically because parents are really against some of the public and political things we've done. So I can take it. But really, what what I want to to and it was great to hear the panel because you get to hear. They did flower it up a bit at the beginning, so I was glad near the end that they actually <laughs> talked about some challenges. And one of the biggest challenges with the way it's set up in BC and the service um, and the public perception or politically the, the thrust and drive for behavior analysts to do early autism intervention is that they don't call in speech and language pathologists from the beginning. They wait until there's a huge problem huge, you know, a learning history, and then say, fix it, which is more difficult. And I guess the other thing that I've seen is, as speech pathologists, we know that there are absolutely things we can't train non-speech pathologists to do. And so it does take a speech pathologist to do those parts, and like the phonology and the phonemic awareness and, you know, that whole shaping of, of speech that there, I mean, I, I spent two years at New Haven trying to do a task analysis, write out step by step, okay, if you're going to start shaping words, you know, which substitutions are best, and then what's the next rule? After they have this substitution, where can you go to? And it's not like that. I couldn't do it. I wanted to really hand, you know, my behavior interventionist and my behavior consultants this, this kind of list, skills list about start at one and go to... 200, and you're, you will have you know, shaped, um, shaped intelligibility, it didn't work. And so the short, you know, the, the end result was me saying, um, yeah, forget it. You can't do that on your own. You need a speech pathologist. Don't try and do this on your own. You're going to make mistakes. So I don't, I don't mean to diss the field of speech pathology. There is equal dissing. <laughs> That's the word for the for behavior analysts. And again, I think one of the things that we're starting to that was really at the fore of Applied Behavior Analysis International, that conference for the last two years, has been that the behavior analysts have been reprimanded, publicly reprimanded in that conference. The key notes have been on um, behavior analysts' conduct in public about you are not God, you are don't be so cocky. Be more humble. You don't know everything. Our research doesn't tell us everything. You, you know, you're publishing things um, that, you know, and I was glad that I think Pat had it on there. We don't know a lot about autoclitics, but sometimes if you talk to a, a person who does verbal behavior, they'll, and you need to do these autoclitics, and there isn't the research support for that as well. So I think both fields are pretty equal in a lot of areas. Um, what we need to start doing is figuring out communication-wise how to have those tough 
discussions. Uh, here's the question. Uh, Pat mentioned that there may be areas in which a VC is not trained, for example, typical development of language or swallowing. Um, ideally, a VC would seek consultation with an SLP in these areas. If an SLP suspects that a VC does not have the knowledge or experience of a certain topic, how might he or she approach the VC without ruffling feathers, but ensuring that the client receives best sure. practice? You're seeing something and you think that they don't have, it's not in their scope of practice, and you're, an and you're an SLP, and how do you approach them? Again, I think it's make sure that that person, that BC, has the information about what is in different people or different professionals' scope of practice. And you can't, uh, that speech path, if it was, was it swallowing? It didn't say. For example. For example, swallowing, which is a... Or eating. Or eating disorders. So, and that's a huge one because there's a lot of swallowing dysphagia. There's a lot of scope of practice issues when you're doing feeding and eating disorders for children with ASD. As a speech path, it's not in my scope of practice. I didn't take dysphagia when I graduated. So I would actually have to refer to another speech pathologist. And I've had that question on some teams when we're looking at that goal and the BC turns to me and says, okay, so you know what do we need to do? And I say, uh, we need to get a speech pathologist who actually knows dysphagia because I can't do it. And so again, but make sure everybody has the information they need. Some, in some places, the person who does dysphagia in Ontario, unfortunately, it's not even speech pathologists. A lot of times it's occupational therapists. Mm -hmm. So we're pulling in another team member for that. Again, it's information, but you need to, and remember at the end of the, the talk I talked about being able to articulate requests and be assertive about your requests and asking what do you understand about what's needed for this client or this goal? What do you understand about who does those things? Do you know, have you ever had another client who had this issue, who helped you? So asking those questions, non-threatening, but trying to, get that information open so you can do the planning. As a speech pathologist, it would be important to know if the behavior consultant is a board-certified behavior analyst um, because we know that if just a behavior consultant doesn't have the same credentials as a board-certified behavior analyst. Um, if the person is a board-certified associate behavior analyst... Um, assistant. Assistant. Okay, you would be able to... They just change that. Um, you can speak with them, and then if for some reason you don't get any resolution, they would have a supervising board-certified behavior analyst. Oh, I so, using this example, just for this uh, speech path out here, how can, how could we say that? I mean, you did pretty much say, but how exactly would you like that worded so that we don't offend you? <laughs> because you know we're very social, and we don't you know we're not we're not known necessarily to be very assertive. So we need permission almost to say. Okay, what, what, how, how could that be fixed to you? Um, yeah, it's like it individual, you know, the relationships that you have with people. So I guess it depends on your level of familiarity because with some people you could say, well, you know, be more frank and direct up front to say, um, you know, it, it seems to me that this is something that maybe requires someone else's involvement, someone who has expertise in these areas, because this is kind of my perspective and being clear about that, but still, I don't know, I guess sort of my style too is to be somewhat tentative to say, let's kind of stay open, right, to try and see where this conversation is going to go so I can feel you out and see, are you going to, now I'm switching roles, I'm pretending, I guess, to be the okay. SLP, um, so to kind of see judge what the person's response is and then see. And I think in some cases, when you have to sort of pull rank or if you really think, right, then you're ethically obliged to say, you know, this is, I, I'm concerned about this. This is not something where I think I, we need to get in someone else with the expertise. I have that expertise as the SOP, so I have something to offer. Can we talk about how to... So those are some of my thoughts. If we are doing something and we don't have data to show that we are making progress on it, yeah. um, then we won't, we can't hide behind we won't you know we know that if our data is not showing that we're making progress we will make a change and that's you know you, we will ask for help you should ask for help if you are not making progress so that helps can i just add a quick point to that so for example um one of my favorites that i read about um, you might be able to get data on something and you might be able to teach it but it might not be the right thing right so one of my favorites was in an article i read and um a child had been taught 
commenting by a behavioural consultant. Um, I can't remember the article, but it was child had been taught commenting, um, in inverted commas, um, such that this child would go into his own kitchen and say, oh, look, there's a table. Well, that's not really commenting, and if it is, it's not useful commenting. So that would be where, you know, it would have been good for the behavioural consultant and SLP to have really talked about that, because, yes, you can teach that, and, yes, there would be data on it, but developmentally, <laughs> clearly that child wasn't ready for commenting. My guess is that the other early developing communicative functions weren't in place because you don't go round in your own family kitchen and comment on a table. <laughs> that is just not helpful. So, you know, that's an example where there needed to be a little bit more closer collaboration where the SLP's input regarding um, developmental trajectories for functions of communication would have been helpful. Guidelines for the board certified behavior analysts. Um, when behavior analysts aren't sure how to proceed or don't have the expertise in a particular area, they are supposed to um, find and bring in other professionals. Um, so um, I don't know if you want to remind them of that, but um, it's just it's it, it's important that um, that you know that they're supposed to be accountable. The other way to actually um, open up a dialogue for behavior analysts or behavior consultants is to give them a research paper to read. So a lot of us are pretty nerdy that way in behavior analysis, um, love to read literature. So if you can find a research paper that supports your feeling and what the points that you want to make, just say, oh, I found this, you know, here you go, pass it along, really friendly. And again, learn some of the principles of applied behavior analysis and use those against those free-feeding adults. So get them a coffee, bring in cookies, go for lunch. It's, it's, it's not bribing, it's reinforcement. Um, <laughs> prefer that word. No, it happens antecedently, it's bribery. <laughs> 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 but what you want to do is establish, I think, what we... Rapport building. Rapport, Sorry, yeah. rapport building. Rapport building. <laughs> what, what you want to do is establish relationships like you've heard on the panel. And the other thing that was clear on the panel is that, um, although they didn't articulate it in the same way, I've taken a lot of courses on change theory and how long does change take to occur. And I've taken it from an organizational business management perspective perspective. So when, you know, I don't know, people come in and want to restructure GM, how long does that actually take internally for everybody? So opinions, um, personal relationships, feelings about the company, how long does that take? Five years. Five years for systems change. So this isn't quick. This is going to take a long time. And you mentioned that in your multidisciplinary team. This is, you're going to go through periods of time where it's not the right fit for people. And, you know, when you look at change theory, there's early adopters, there's those middle of road people, and then there's that percentage that will never change. And those people end up leaving because it isn't positive for them. So you have to keep that in mind, too. This is a, we're starting a conversation about something that's going to take a while. But, I, you know, we all have agreed that it will be better in the end. I just have one kind of quick add on to that. So I, yep. Yeah, just a quick add on to that is that in terms of change that, you know, maybe sometimes it's just about planting a seed, right? Having a conversation to kind of like today, maybe it plants some seeds in people's minds or something that kind of sticks with you or whether it's something because it's sort of aggravating or, okay, yeah, that kind of fits with my philosophy or the way I think about things. So, you know, sometimes I think, too, it's not expecting that there's going to be a 360-degree shift. Maybe it's five degrees, you know, but something that kind of plants a seed in somebody's mind and maybe gets them to do something a little bit differently in the future. Um, okay, here's another, uh, another one that I think is relevant to this whole conversation. I'm going to abbreviate this. I'm an SLP in a public setting with preschoolers. I see a client usually one time a week for 30 to 45 minutes. With many of my ASD clients, I already feel that this is too little to affect real change. Uh, here's my question. If I have a client who's doing ABA 20 hours a week, what is my role? Is my SLP treatment section session really doing anything? Should SLPs not focus on intervention and focus more on consulting? That is, like, suggest goals based on developmental norms, over CBIs, so forth and so on. Like how, how do you resolve this? There isn't enough money to, mm -hmm. right? Is that, yeah. right? And yeah. I, again, I, I think anybody on the, in the anybody? group wants to Let's do with that, PC or that. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. well, I find myself in a very similar situation, and 
Uh, it depends on the family. Um, if they are the kind of family that are kind of running the show, so to speak, and, and, and are educated and can make some decisions, I've gone to them and said, hey, I can do 45 minutes a week with your child. What would you like me to do? I can focus on some of the goals that you, you have, or I can go to the daycare, or I can keep going as I have been. But I recognize that it's limited, and I recognize that we're going to make limited progress, probably. But maybe there's ways that you feel comfortable, and I'll feel comfortable knowing that we both both agree that we're agreeing to this idea, and that perhaps the and you might be surprised. You actually might be able to affect more change than you think, especially if it's generalization or if it is going to the daycare. And, and often daycares are really needing some support. So. Minutes a week. Behavior consultants probably only get two hours a month. So it's not, the discrepancy isn't as broad as you may think it is. The BIs are running the uh, ABA program maybe 20 hours or more a week. But it's not like the, B the BC is actually seeing the child for very great amounts of time either. So on both sides, we're very limited. And I think that, uh, sorry, am I <laughs> in the room to breathe? Um, um, I think that uh, it, it's, a, it's a problem that the BIs have solved greatly for um, behavior consultants. And on teams that I've worked on, we have included the goals that the speech and language person wants to do into those therapy sessions. Now, I don't necessarily supervise the BI to uh, run those goals because I can't. It's not part of my expertise. But if the SLP can do that, then that can work very effectively. So there's lots of ways to do it. And I suppose the other part of that is child training. So you know, if the goals have been if the goals have been picked collaboratively, so there isn't too much overlap, or and one supporting the other, or you know, if the community SLP decides to work directly on speech because the consultative model that the child's having in the other program doesn't allow that, then um, then really, I suppose the parent training of the parent becomes the other important factor. So in the same way as, you know, we can deliver so many hours of service a week because we have the eyes, then community professionals I know train parents so that that child can have practice every day, for example, or a few days a week. So I suppose that's the other part of it as well. I have had two clients this past year, um, both who were under six, and I got to see for an hour a week and two extremely different models. So one of them, I went to a team meeting and the behavior consultant blankly refused to work with me. So I continued to see the child individually and have her parents come and watch every session so that as much as possible could be carried over and used at home. And the other one, I consulted to a consultant and had the BIs working on all of the language goals. So the question had to do with do I <laughs> do I um, stop focusing on direct service and move more to a consultative model? And it sounds like people handle that differently. Is that really is that uh, so asking the family, asking working with the rest of the team to figure out what will work best for that entire situation. But, but certainly, it seems like the general consensus is that, you know, 30 to 45 minutes a week actually is quite a lot of time for an SLP, especially relative to the amount of time that kids often see VCs. And I think that's an important point, Sharon, because I think that most people think that kids are seeing VCs for like hours a week, and like that's not usually on there. And I would say, echoing what, what Jenny has said, um, it really depends on it depends on the goals for the child. It depends on the family and how well that child responds to therapies. But in general, whenever you can have someone there who has the potential to carry over and learning across the week, then you're going to do more. Other comments? Oh, well, no, yeah. yeah, I just want to remind us all that the Baker School Board had a completely consultative model for 25 or 30 years. And cuts came. They were a lot of them were cut because when you're in a consultative role in a big district, people don't notice that you're actually doing anything. And so I would not recommend that in the long term for this problem. Mm -hmm. um, okay, here's another. Actually, this is this is one that I feel like. What, who said danger go all over again? Is that? 
Yogi, Yogi Berra? I feel like deja vu all over again. Because this question is, in, in a sense, the question that served as the impetus for staging this event in the first place. So, um, As an SLP, I've heard on several occasions from clients and some ABA VCs that we are not needed. Why? I'm not sure that uh, why is an interesting word here. Why do some ABA programs say an SLP is not needed and their program can handle all intervention, especially if a child is new to intervention and their learning potential style has not yet been determined? The way this question came to us in the very first meeting was, why do some VCs say to families, you don't need an, need an SLP, you have me? Wants to deal with that. <laughs> uh, well, and part of it is why. I mean, I think that's more the existential question. <laughs> more to the point, what what might one do about that little situation? <laughs> and again, it's important to discriminate between BCs and BCBAs. There's okay. a difference in training, right? And as someone that was alluding to earlier, as part of the professional standards, as a professional you know what you know and you know what you don't know. So if you're behaving professionally, you recognize that and you call the SLP. I didn't get a chance to answer the swallowing question earlier, but <laughs> what I know about swallowing is that you should talk to an SLP. <laughs> and I tell my kids not to chew, you know, chew well and don't swallow your steak and choke, but that's all I know about swallowing. So, so know what you know and so it's ignorance. If you think you can do everything, you are suffering from a lack of humility and you're not behaving very professionally. I concur. You have the definitive answer to that. <laughs> so what is, okay, so if I'm an SLP, I'll just push this a little. So I'm an SLP and I've been sidelined. Families have been told, you don't need, you don't, you have, you don't need an SLP, you have me. What, do you have any advice for me now as an SLP? What do I, what do I do? How do I go, do I go to that behavior consultant? Do I, how, what do I do about the situation? Anybody want to advise me? I think that the SLP should ask to uh, to meet with the BC and, and have a discussion and, and talk about how the SLP can help and ask that, that question directly, you know, why that you think you can help. Mm-hmm. And we've actually had not the same, um, exactly the same example, but we've had a fam- families who um, have gone to other ABA programs Another ABA program said, not a problem, we'll have him talking within six months. And, you know, the family leaves our program and goes to a new um, program, and guess what? That doesn't happen. So, you know, it's, I think sometimes that sort of arrogance, it's not sort of just confined to, you know, one profession treating another profession that way. You see it happening within professions too. So, you know, it is about a, 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 a general sense, about a lack of knowledge and, you know, and a really high level of arrogance. I think um, um, what I would suggest to the speech language pathologist is going to the MCFD website and looking at the manual that the MCFD has for working with families with kids with autism. And they can look at an example of what collaboration looks like because it talks about how the behavioral plan of intervention needs to be written in collaboration with the family and with the professionals on the team. There's an example of a behavioral plan of intervention there and the members of the team it's outlined as it, um, a speech language pathologist is included, as well as the occupational therapist. And the particular domains that need to be worked on are social skills, communication, and play skills. And I think that you can have a conversation with the family as a speech language pathologist of what you can bring to the table to address those goals. So I think you can use the resources out there that, that the province has given us to support you working with kids with autism. The other thing I was going to say is I we said it numerous times, but it, it works for both ways. But I think, especially for the speech pathologist, because of the way the service is set out, you you can be very much the outsider and trying to get into that team. And I went to a full day workshop at ABBA last year, um, done by a group of psychologists, um, and it really was on how do you collaborate, how do you establish teams when you're not the wanted person. Um, whether you're the BCBA or the speech pathologist, and it really was, we're all about getting the most done the quickest we can get done. Um, I think it's our personalities, no matter you know which profession you're in. But they very much were of the, if you can, if you, the parent allows it, you have to go slow. 
You have to sort of win the team over without actually doing a lot sometimes. It's not as much as you want to get done, but I've sat in whole meetings just nodding and smiling and not saying one word, not actually advancing my goals at all, not getting them to change anything, and it was really difficult. It was really difficult because did, did I think I had valuable things to add? Absolutely. As a speech pathologist, absolutely. As a behavior analyst, I've been on both sides, absolutely, but I didn't say anything. And then, you know, by asking the parent, maybe you can get the behavior program and just write a little note. Oh, I've got some materials for this. Speech pathologists uh, have access to a lot of materials. Lots that behavior analysts have no idea about. And so that's how I started to get in with behavior consultants. Because I had a lot of materials and I'd say, oh, I noticed you're working on this. I'm going to send this along. Did you know there was this or there's this software? We're really good on apps and software too. And so there's this. And that's how I started. But very slow, very non-threatening. And eventually, as we became more of a team, then the, the cusp of it is, as soon as they ask you, though, for your professional opinion, that's when you can go in and give it. But this workshop said, don't say anything before you're asked, basically, is how you become a good team person. So it was, it's a hard lesson, but that's what we have to do. Tracy, you think it was the hierarchy of skill, training, and development for Swiss pathologists and how to work away in. <laughs> I think VCs also have that um, experience yes. in school, yes. very much, right, where we're the, the, the VC is the outsider, it's the school-based team, yes. there's all the school people, and you're trying to kind of worm or weedle or beg or see or kind of move your way in. And you, you end up buying a lot of lockets before you yeah. well, I mean, it's the lockets strategy. You end up buying a lot of lockets for a lot of people before you're invited to give your first opinion. And I think what we all learn is that if you give your first opinion in a too pushy way or too quickly, it, it just delays the whole the whole germination process. It's like overwatering a plant. You know? I think one other really important factor, especially in the kids over six, is that all our services are expensive and families do have to make a choice at times. They just can't afford everyone. Um, and at times it may seem more important to do something for a while and they may come back around to us um, or ask us for a consultation on when a problem comes up or whatever. But I think we really need to go with... We can, we can make recommendations based on what we think is best for that family or for that child, um, but it's the family's choice how they're going to spend their money. All right, uh, a few more here. Um, um, well, I mean, this is sort of what we've been talking about, but maybe people have additional advice. How do you resolve philosophical slash methodological conflicts for a particular client? So now we've got two people involved, an SLP and a BC, but they are giving differing recommendations to a BI about what to do about an issue that's within both of their scopes of practice. Um, so, for example, regarding how to address a behavior challenge or how to model a certain target or whatever, right? So now we've got a different situation. Two people involved, both know something about this. They want to approach it very differently. You know, how, how, how do we resolve that? Karen? Yeah. That's exactly what I was going to say. Yes. I mean, so one person's going to have to give to the other and say, okay, let's try your way. Let's collect data and we'll see how it goes. Because there is not necessarily one way of teaching something or approaching something. And, and how you can tell whether it was the right way or not is by the data. So I've often done that, um, whether it be with a speech and language person or an, an OT or even sometimes... Uh, a parent has an idea about how they want to approach something and, and I would say, okay, well, well, we'll take data on it and then that can help you make your decision because it doesn't need to be an emotional thing. It just needs to be what works for that child and, of course, we have our ethical guidelines and all those things, but really it's about what works. Other responses to that one? No. I was going to say that's exactly what I was saying for data and it's hard, again, I think Richard said it, you know, or someone said it. So many people are talking about the straight. You know, sort of sometimes you have to check your ego. And because if you're you and, and speech pads use data and and behavior consultants use data, 
and it's easier, it's concrete. And it's not in either field that we are going to take away something that's effective. So it's really easy. You decide, you read the data. If that's worked, you keep going with it, no matter who it came from. If it isn't working, we have to change it. And so then you can go, okay, on to plan B. I think, again, that whole humor, use of humor, and be able to, being able to say, oh, that was a really stupid idea. Okay, it didn't pan out. We're on to yours. Your turn now. I think keeping it light and doing that helps a lot. We just had a client who, um, outside of the field of, of behavior analysis and speech pathologist, client um, actually from out west, moved to Toronto area. Um, hyperbaric oxygen therapy is really big in our area. Um, they spend a lot of money on it. Um, the evidence isn't there at all yet. Uh, so, you know, the client, the parent came to us and said, we want to do this. And again, we've now learned, we don't go, no, you don't. Here's all the research against it, blah, blah, blah. We say, oh, okay, and why do you want to do it? And we got those specific goals. What measurement should we be tracking? They're in an IBI program in, with us in my center. So that program is 25 hours a week of direct therapy. So we track everything anyway. So we said, okay, these will earmark. We're going to, you know, nothing's going to change in their program. The only thing that's being added is hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Great. Tell us the date. We're not even going to tell the BIs, the, we call the instructor therapists, the frontline people, so they won't know. So there's not a placebo effect or some kind of effect that may cloud our data. We're going to let it go. We're going to see. And then we're going to meet in a few weeks. You know, do, do they give you a timeline? When, when's a good time to meet? Unbeknownst, so we started taking data, and, um, and problem behavior was going up and up and up, and we are like, what's going on? And then unbeknownst to us, well, no, we knew eventually after mom told us, she had um, burst two ear eardrums because of the hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So that is a side effect. That is, you know, they don't always tell parents, but that is a side effect. So the doctor, her medical doctor said, no, you have to cease and desist this until everything gets healed. So we had a two-week natural break in treatment of hyperbaric oxygen therapy. Meanwhile, applied behavior analysis is continuing. We look at the data, the graphs were unbelievable. Problem behavior goes like this. The day she stopped going to hyperbaric oxygen therapy with two burst eardrums, behavior fell off, stayed low for two weeks. She went back, behavior went right back up, problem behavior. And so we went to mom and said, look, can we share this with you? And we had no intention. We were not going to tell parents to stop. We just wanted to share data. We shared, and by the end of the session, she had phoned and canceled everything and said, well, that tells us what happens with hyperbaric oxygen therapy. So again, it's treating everything like that. We have clients that do all kinds of things. But again, if we can get people to take data and be really clear about what we're measuring, it shows us what's effective and what isn't. Good, thanks. Um, so uh, two things, I think, Tracy, two things for you, if that's OK. Uh, I know you've been doing a lot of talking, but you know. We do it home, so we can hit these people up on them. So two things. Um, one is, uh, what's wrong with SLPs having their own trial and individualizing for the client? You implied that that was not okay. Okay. Or people heard that you, people thought you implied that. So what's wrong, there's nothing wrong with having a style if you actually know that what you're doing is effective for your clients. So what, what isn't okay is having a style and just changing things on a whim and like, oh, you know, I didn't really get good results last week, so I'm going to do something completely different this week. And if you're not taking careful data and watching what you're doing, you're never going to know what it is about your own therapy that's being really effective and what isn't. And lots of times we think it's just because of client X. This kid's R is really difficult. I can't get anywhere. I tried this, and now I tried this, and now I tried this. And we see that, we see that in behavior analysis, where people change things really rapidly. In fact, they change way quicker than speech pathologists. Um, so you really need to think about what you're doing. And when you, when you can say, oh, my style is, I like to be structured, I have, try to get this many trials in, I use reinforcement based on the child's need, you know, likes. If, if you can define that about yourself, or you know what your style is, that's fine. What I'm saying is, you actually, though, that's part of your data, that your style is affecting the outcomes. 
And so you just need to be aware of what your style is and not just keep changing based on, okay, I'm not getting outcomes, I'm going to become someone else or like someone else. So that's all that was. Okay. Good. Um, well, and uh, there's, a, there's another question that I'm, I'm actually, that's related to that I'm going to put to the rest of the folks, which is what role does personal style play in the professional practice of ABA? BC? Are we all the same? I think it could social skills help. <laughs> uh, I think having a different style as an instructor helps with generalization. Mm-hmm. Um, there's lots of sort of standardization in terms of having these different principles and techniques that we use, but I think certainly as Sharon's saying with good social skills, I mean, really it's about having relationships with people and finding a way, you know, it's going to be different with every family, every child that you work with, although, again, as I say, there's sort of standard principles and techniques you apply, it is going to look different sort of from one client to the next, at least to some degree. I and another consultant in the room run a summer camp, and we have a lot of high-functioning teenagers, especially teenage boys, and we have noticed a massive correlation that the teenage guys that are trying to be cool, we purposefully pair with the cool guys that we hire. And they have responded so well to it, so obviously I can't go in as a cool guy every day to my therapy, but (laughs) I do think that there's a lot more than just the therapy activities that help progress. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. The, the high school boy that we work with, he's had two young female interventionists for seven or eight years. He gets along very well with them. He's in high school now. He's a guy who's been surrounded by gals forever. And mom hired a new guy to work with a guy. His name is Mark. Mark was formerly a nightclub bouncer. <laughs> <laughs> He looks the part. He looks like Mr. Queen. And our guy loves Mark. And so he gets, Mark gets all sorts of stuff out of him that, that other people don't. So there's that element of style. I'm trying to think about my own style. It's kind of just adaptable and flexible and chameleon. I think if someone followed me to four different homes, you can see four different interaction styles because they're dealing with different families, different languages, different cultures, different, you know, grandma in the home is not the of family or not, and that's part of the demographic of our area. So, it's a bit of a healing style. Mm-hmm. Would you ever play an art without service? <laughs> <laughs> I'm too short. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. Uh, oh, sorry. I have one more for Tracy, and then I think we may be out of time, because I know you all want to go crawling in the rain. Um, so, this is, again, back to some, something that um, someone heard you say. <laughs> Um, it seems unwarranted that a BC should ethically comment on the practice of an SLP when there are significant differences between models and acceptable levels of evidence-based practice. Right. So that one where I talk, comment about in the in the behavior anal behavior analyst um, ethics that we actually have to uh, review, analyze, um, assess what's going on by other professionals. It's when there's direct uh, therapy going on with ABA services at the same time. So what we try and do, we don't, we're, we're not always able to do that because we don't see the other person. There's not a good relationship. Um, you know, they don't want to share their data. But what it means is, as behavior analysts, we want to make sure what we're doing, we can, we attribute the gains or the mastered targets to the right person. So if it's actually the speech pathologist who has, you know, taught that child how to request and, you know, there's 50 new words, they've taught that child and the behavior interventionists and behavior consultants haven't done that, we can't lay claim to it and we shouldn't lay claim to it and vice versa. So the whole assessing what someone else does is just that, trying to control those variables that we are sure what is affecting the behavior change of that child. And it could be for increasing a skill or decreasing problematic behavior. So there's a lot of occupational therapists I work with too where 
they're doing sensory integration approaches and we have a, an IBI program going on so we will work together to say okay is there a specific goal you have in mind with that can we take a certain type of data to assess what you're doing um, because they're consultants in the schools or they're consultants in the nursery schools and so they go in on a consultative basis once every month we're in there 25 hours a week doing therapy so we will collaborate with them and say you want to do that great we're keeping it in but we need to operationalize it we need to take data and then can we get together to look how that's look at how it's going and having the desired effect you want it to have and again for certain children we've kept some of those sensory integration approaches in because it's been very effective and we see that in the data for other children we all come back together and even though I just had a last week an OT said yeah, well, that's now being discontinued. That's not working the way it was supposed to because the client actually had less joint attention than more with some of those approaches. So again, it's trying to collaborate to assess. But some people feel threatened even when we say, I know that's your goal. Can we take data on your goal? We're happy to do that. But if it's going to continue, either we need to make sure things aren't going to interfere with what we're doing or we give you credit for what you're doing and we're not. So is that more clear? In some ways you're talking about a co-therapy agreement. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, that's a good way to put it. So in some ways Tracy's talking about a co-therapy agreement. Two SLPs working together, you write up a co-therapy agreement to make sure you're working on the same thing, well, or complementary things, and you know, not somebody's working to extinguish a particular movie, or somebody's working on teaching a child more, and you're working on trying to um, increase the child's expressive, you know, or manding or, or uh, requesting. 